So, you want to know about my stream setup, eh? Well, in this video, we're going to get into all the details, or at least a better portion of them. I don't know why I'm cracking my knuckles. It's not meant to be intimidating. What? I've broken this video down into three main categories. So we have lights, hardware, and peripherals. Why did I choose these three categories? Well, it kind of keeps it simple, and I think I'm realizing that it doesn't really need to be much more complicated than that. So yeah, we're going to go with it. Now I'm sure you could expand these into multiple subcategories or add more categories, but for the sake of this video we're just going to keep it to these main three, and maybe in the future we'll go over some other details. Or maybe we won't, I don't know. Alright, so moving on to our first category of lights. We have a variety of options. So you'll immediately notice to my left some Tetris lights that I have here. These are from ThinkGeek back in the day when they used to be their own entity I believe. Um, or essentially before they merged with GameStop. I miss those days. Anyway, so these lights, um, rather cheaply made. I didn't really know that as much at the time that I bought them, but nevertheless, they look pretty good in the space. If you can manage to kind of keep them together, then they, they usually work. But if you'll notice if you try to maybe space them out, or if, you know, there's a bit of fidgeting on the table, they'll sometimes get a little bit knocked off or a little bit misaligned and then maybe they'll some will turn off or some will kind of flicker. It gives and takes. But if you get them to work, they look pretty good. Um, beside that is a Himalayan salt lamp. So that is a lamp that I've had for a while. And uh, I just, I don't know, I guess I'm just thinking like, lights, put more lights in the space, make it look cool. Um, and so I just added another light to the table. Um, it kind of looks all right there. I uh, have the fallout bobblehead right in front of it. So just kind of more things to add character to the space. Um, beside that I have the diffuser, which has yet to be actually used as a diffuser. I've used it as a light a couple times, but I have yet to put any oils or water even in it. So eventually maybe I'll get around to doing that to make the space smell nicer, even though we don't have smell vision or anything like that. Anyway, moving right along, we also have the LED RGB bulbs, which I have in two of my lamps, which I just kind of have set on a bit of a dynamic sort of smooth transition through the color spectrum to kind of gently change the lighting of the atmosphere just to kind of look a little bit cool. Um, I don't want to have it super abrupt, just kind of gentle to kind of keep the space a little bit fresh all the time. I think kind of, I think it's nice. Now you could also th set them to different, uh, like just a regular color, or you could, you, I guess it depends on the kinds of bulbs you have or the apps that you have for them on how it'll work, but these are just how mine work specifically. I think they look pretty good. Um, do I, could I use more light in the space? Yes, definitely. I wouldn't mind having an RGB floodlight, but I'm trying to not, I'm trying to get more wise, I guess, or trying to exercise some wisdom and just how much I spend on the setup right now. So I'm trying to like hold off on the spending, at least in the department of lights right now. <laughs> Um, but as time continues, we'll see what happens. There are some lights in the background as well, right over by the shelf, or on the shelf rather. Um, I have my milk jar light and my treasure chest light. Um, I find that they're just a kind of pretty good use of objects in a creative way. I think it really helps to kind of add a bit of character. Um, just using like a jar filled with water as a lamp works really well and it's quite cheap and affordable as long as you already have the um, like a, a puck light or some other light source to go along with it then you're pretty much set otherwise if you have to acquire those RGB lights or LEDs I could see how that might be a little bit of a cost but over time you know it can be maybe a worthwhile decision so it's just always good to kind of uh, keep the old brain thinking you know I think that that mostly does it for lights. Other than that, I just kind of put my controller charging stations on the desk so that if any of the controllers are charging, maybe it just kind of has the lights pulsating. So far, it hasn't really been utilized in that way. Normally, they're kind of out of the focus of the camera, and you normally can't really see a whole lot of them at all. You can kind of see the controllers right now. Beyond that, yeah. after that, we're getting into the hardware section. So in terms of hardware, I have my two monitors, both 1080p monitors. 
Um, so I'm not running anything wild, no 4K or anything here yet. But they're both running off of my laptop, surprisingly. You may not have guessed that they'd be running off of a laptop, but I find that, at least for right now, this is all I really can do, and it works rather well. So the laptop that I am running the monitors off of is a Razer Blade 15 inch, I believe. Uh, this is the older model from 2018. It has 16 gigabytes of RAM, an Intel Core i7-7700 HQ CPU, 2.8 gigahertz, and a NVIDIA GeForce GTX 1060, I believe, which um, for the time uh, wasn't too bad, but is kind of outclassed um, compared to more modern day PCs now and components in the current day. But uh, nonetheless, it still manages to work fairly well for all the stuff I use it for. And so that's, I guess, all you can ask for. Um, at least while you're kind of still in that stage of, you know, maybe growing or waiting for the ability to get other things to continue to grow and expand your horizons of hardware, software, etc. But anyway, uh, other than that, behind the laptop that is on the cooling pad as well, which I think is good when you have a laptop because at least this laptop really kind of throttles. Like it's like you could tell when it's working hard because it's like it sounds like it's about to take off. You know what I mean? So I think having the cooling pad there is definitely just an extra plus, even if it is only a marginal plus or, or a small plus, it's still a plus. Uh, behind the laptop we have the Xbox One, PS3, PS4, and Nintendo Switch. Um, I tried to place them fairly stylistically, but eh, it looks alright. It usually it kind of gets covered up by the monitor, but uh, I think it just kind of trying to use the space I guess as best as I can might as well. And I also, when I was originally setting it up, tried to position them in such a way where it kind of covers up the mess of cables uh, behind them, which is, I guess, a bit of a foreshadowing of what this whole thing will present, is that cables are everywhere. So many cables. That's probably one of the main hurdles is cable management with a setup like this, or any setup kind of similar to this. And so I'll kind of be detailing a little bit about that maybe more as the video goes on. But anyway, so I have all of the consoles set up. Behind the consoles, I have a Ethernet uh, switch, which I just kind of use because I already had it, because I bought it thinking that it was a router. And then <laughs> Long story short, I ran a like 100 foot Ethernet cable up to my room and plugged into the switch, and now I plug everything into there. So now I have really as many things plugged in as I have the ethernet cables for so I believe I plugged in my laptop I plugged in my PlayStation and I think I plugged in my Xbox yeah it seems like I did um, so just to kind of help with download speeds and other stuff because you know that Modern Warfare it's uh, approaching 200 gigabytes Wow anyway so the dogs barking again we're gonna try to get through this so I have all of those plugged in as well, and all those have their own cables, so I try to kind of hide it behind the consoles, um, and then that kind of runs down into the back where the power bars are. I don't know how much I want to get into the cables just yet, so we'll move on to the specs of the monitors. So as far as I can remember, uh, I don't remember what the hertz are of these monitors, but the monitors themselves are not too bad. They're definitely on kind of the more budget end of monitors. Um, the BenQ monitor that I have here is one of the more cheaper ranged ones. It's the one from, if you look it up on Amazon, it'll probably be somewhere around the $120, $130 range Canadian, maybe. So this monitor is more of just kind of like I wanted to get something that was, you know, pretty decent looking in terms of uh, its makeup and, you know, form factor? Hardware? I don't really know what word to use. In other words, I saw that it was BenQ, and I kind of trust BenQ. Um, I haven't heard really anything bad about BenQ, although don't quote me on it, because, you know, I don't keep up to date on everything. But uh, so far, it's been pretty good. Although, I have encountered some weird technical issues, but I think that's more of a PC issue slash Windows software issue, and less of a, the monitor's fault. Um, and, yeah, so I, I don't really know what that's about, but sometimes, like, file explorer will just look weird and pixelated i'm pretty sure it's a windows issue because then other times it'll just be fine so i don't know i digress uh so we have the benq monitor which has blue light filtering on it which is just good for your overall eye health as far as i know and then you also have the 
other monitor that I have set up, which is not necessarily a monitor, but I guess more of a TV. It's the PlayStation 3D TV that came out around mid-generation PS3. You may have remember it being advertised on TV with like MotorStorm Apocalypse or uh, Killzone 3. Um, I, I had it for quite a while now, and I've used it actually as a monitor for several years. Actually, I used it for my monitor when I built my first PC when I was like just after grade 10. So that was uh, a few years ago now. It may not be the most aesthetic monitor nowadays, like it's definitely not 4K, but I feel that in terms of its overall design, it looks pretty good. It's, it's a pretty aesthetically pleasing monitor in terms of its physical shape, and its built-in sound is not too bad either. It's definitely probably capable of a higher decibel amount compared to other monitors of its size or TVs of its size, um, so that could be a plus. Um, down the road, if I get more monitors, I might use the PlayStation TV as kind of a, you know, more casual couch co-op or console let's play TV and then have other monitors probably down the road being 4K set up instead in the future. So I think it's, I guess one of the things to keep in mind with your setup is, you know, maybe expect change to happen at some point down the road, um, whether it be small tweaks or larger changes like I comparing my setup now to how it was before it's it's quite an addition um, like you know a whole other table here which I think helps kind of just with more space for whatever you want to do like uh, having that extra table space for you know whether I want to do some drawing or whatever you know just having the space for that is definitely a plus plus. Um, and so I guess just keeping your your mind sort of kind of always thinking maybe about ways that you can improve even if those means may not be achievable right away, it's kind of good to kind of catalog it in your mind for later. But it's also good to be content about what you have and uh, to be able to work with what you have right now, I think is, is also a healthy mindset. But anyway, I told you that there'd probably be some rambling in this, or at least I think I told you. You probably know me well enough if you've seen any of my stuff like this that there's rambling. <laughs> All right, so now that I think we've covered most of the hardware, we're going to be moving on to the peripherals. The key difference between hardware and peripherals for this video in my mind is I consider hardware more of the PCs and consoles and all of the other things that I plug in kind of just things that support those pieces of hardware. So it's not that a capture card isn't hardware, but I guess I consider it more as a peripheral to the main hardware. Um, so that's just kind of with how the category system, I guess, for this video works. Starting with our Elgato HD60S capture card, which is plugged into a HDMI splitter, which is then plugged into a HDMI hub. So there is a lot of cables going on just for this grand scheme of being able to switch HDMIs rather quickly. Ultimately, it kind of pays off though, because I don't have to unplug and replug things midstream. It prevents a lot of the Kind of headaches of trying to switch over to a different game if I want to and so that's really nice and it makes it really easy I have it all hooked up to this uh, hub which has this little remote that I can use to easily switch the inputs you just switch the HDMI's over actually sometimes uh, if I have my PC turned on and then I'll turn on the PlayStation 4 it'll the TV will manage to kind of auto switch which is pretty interesting um, will it do this all the time? I don't really know, but sometimes it works, so that's cool. But otherwise, if, it, if you don't have a monitor or TV that does that, the remote makes that process very easy for you. But one thing I specifically want to point out about the HDMI hub setup is that I don't know how many people talk about using a capture card to capture PC gameplay on the same PC that you're also streaming on. So that's a lot of words that I just said there, but essentially what I mean is is that I'll have my consoles plugged into the HDMI hub, but I'll also have one of my monitors plugged in via the HDMI hub as well. So my main monitor will be plugged in through the HDMI hub. So if I want to capture the gameplay through the capture card, I can do that because it's kind of doing this weird kind of loop system of one of the displays, even though I'm capturing or I'm running the card off of the laptop, I'm still also able to kind of capture off of a monitor that's plugged into it. It gets kind of confusing, but it works 
if you do it right. Um, do I recommend this? Uh, if you don't have a better option, but I think that Streamlabs OBS tends to make it fairly simple to capture anything that you're doing off of um, most applications. Sometimes it might be a little bit finicky to try to tab out and um, make any kind of other uh, multitasking happen, but these are kind of things that you might learn to work with as you continue to do your streaming and other stuff. Ideally down the road I would just like to use the laptop to stream everything off of and then have that PC gameplay on a desktop in which then the capture card is capturing the desktop gameplay. Long term goal, right now, not something that I'm going to be able to achieve, but maybe in the future when there's more funds there for it. Um, but in the meantime, this kind of whole laptop setup works. And I think that that's one of the key things I want to point out is you want something that works. Moving on from the capture card, we have a USB hub, which is rather helpful, but there's not just one, there's technically three, because you have the, US, the main USB hub, which is plugged into the laptop, and then we have two other USB hubs plugged into that USB hub, one of which is used to power other things, and one of which is used kind of for me to just plug in hard drives and stuff like that. Uh, so we got a lot of USB ports with a lot of cables, and we have everything from, you know, mouse and keyboard, headphones, mic, uh, webcam, uh, you know, a charger cable. After the USB hubs, we have my series of external drives. So I have an external HDD, which I think is five or eight terabytes, which I use mainly to store the bulk of my video stuff for YouTube or past YouTube uploads, as well as, you know, memories, other, you know, pictures, whatever, like just kind of whatever I have that isn't um, school or more immediate. I have put on there to kind of free up space on my laptop and other drives as well. Then I have my external, I believe, two terabyte Seagate SSD, which I use to put past school projects from previous semesters, or if I feel that I'm not going to be touching it in the current semester, but it's been made in the current semester, then I'll put it on there. So in other words, stuff that I don't think that I'll be working on immediately anymore, I'll put on there, I'll offload onto this drive. And then I have my third external drive that I use. This is used for current projects. So I'll use this during the semester when I have projects that are, I'm, you know, I have Unreal Engine files that I'm running, you know, or I'm just running Unreal Engine or 3ds Max. All that stuff is going on this drive because it's a M.2 NVMe drive, 250 gigabytes, which is one of the, I think it's one of the fastest external drives you can get today in general and it's can you know very confidently run unreal engine off of it you know with i think very little hurdle at all it, it works quite well it's quite fast and so that's what i use for all of my you know in the moment projects and then eventually when those are done they'll get offloaded onto the other ssd um, after the external hard drives we have kind of just the other peripherals so i guess you, you, in some cases you could almost consider these lights but i have the controller charging docks which you know when you dock the controller you know I guess the light kind of glows sometimes so I guess you could consider it lights but that's kind of why I position them there but they normally are kind of on the edge of the frame or out of the frame so it's more or less just you know kind of a good place to just put the controllers just because it maybe adds a bit more character to that this is a gaming stream or a gaming setup ultimately I think that controller chargers are nice I think that being able to just kind of hot swap out your controllers it's really convenient having to not um, always have it plugged in i think that if you can afford to do that it's pretty nice um, is it necessary no but it, it can be make things a little bit easier um, i also have my playstation move controllers there um, and speaking of vr i have the vr box without the headset plugged into it right now the headset is actually on the shelf in the back but maybe i'll start doing some vr streaming eventually I feel like that's kind of on, on the brain for down the road, but we'll see what happens. Because that was actually one of the big things, of, or one of the things that motivated the way that this setup is orientated, is there's just, a, the floor space is a bit more usable now for stuff like VR. I feel like the floor space is more efficiently used now. And so it opens up opportunities for doing um, VR stuff or other things like that. Maybe if I set up another table in here for a podcast or something. I think that these are all important things to maybe consider when you're wanting to upgrade your setup that you would have you know kind of the space to use for different things that you might be thinking about doing for the future and it's kind of good to improve your setup based around those goals 
otherwise in terms of peripherals we have the webcam we have the i guess this could have been put in the light section but it's kind of part of the webcam stand i think if you just look up webcam mount you might be able to find this but i think it's i'm not sure if it's called like a podcasting stand or, or not a podcasting stand maybe like a vlogging stand or something but it's essentially just a a kind of like clamp that has um two bendy poles coming out of it one of them you could mount kind of a little swivel thing for a webcam on and the other one is just a ring light um, i think that it's pretty efficient for what i need to do is kind of you know low maintenance just kind of clamp it onto whatever table you're using and you position accordingly the light itself has some very basic adjustments but allow you to tweak the kind of whether it's more of a blue light or a yellow tinted light um, the, or actually no rather a, a white light compared to a kind of more yellow tinted light you could adjust the intensity a little bit so it kind of just gives you a little bit of range to play with there which can make it nice for when your lighting is maybe not where you'd like it to be after that we have um, a variety of mics on the table not really a huge variety but just kind of uh, what I need for right now so I have <laughs> a rock band mic uh, put on a shock mount on what is a actually a blue snowball stand that is plugged into my PlayStation 4 so that I could have the mic audio going in for that um, without having to try to rewire my setup and run the headset and then plug the blue snowball into the PlayStation and sacrifice the stream audio, you know what I mean? Like, essentially this is the more efficient way that I figured to set it up right now for streaming when I want to play console games because I am able to run the console audio through the capture card and then have the rock band mic pick up my audio and run it to the PlayStation. So it kind of fixes, um, or it allows me to have all the audio going out and coming in efficiently without having to make other compromises. So these are kind of things that I learned as I went through the hurdles and with your own setup, you might realize that there are certain things that kind of make it difficult. It's like, oh, why can't I plug one mic in everything? That would be nice, but I don't really know if there's a way to do that. Maybe there is. Um, but I'm just not familiar on how to do it properly. So at least for my setup, this is what works well for me. Um, moving on from that, we have our blue snowball on a boom arm here. I have a shock mount coming in the mail for it. It hasn't arrived yet. To, no, I don't believe it's arrived yet. I, I made my own mic cover for this because I thought I wanted to add a bit more personality to the mic for the stream. So I bought a Mario Mushroom plushie and I kind of gutted it a little bit and I fitted it over the... Um, the blue snowball and kind of sewed up the fringes a bit and uh, just pinned it around the back. It's pretty simple um, but it makes a good pop filter or at least I think it does um, and it allowed me to not have to have the other pop filter over it and kind of adding extra geometry to the space and it also makes it look cool as well. I find it makes the mic a bit more unique which when you're trying to have a stream that stands out can make a little bit of extra difference. Some other peripherals that I have on my desk as well are my keyboard and mouse. Um, this mouse is a rather cheap mouse from Amazon. It's just one of those gaming mouses that you could find on there. I'm not sure if it's still on there, but it's... One thing I like about this gaming mouse is that it's a silent clicking. So it's... I don't know what it what it is about its makeup, but it allows it that when you click, it doesn't really make any noise compared to what you would normally expect a mouse to make, which I think is fairly nice um, for if you're using it in a, in a public place for whatever reason, or if maybe you have a condenser mic and you want less noise on the stream, um, that could also be a benefit because with FPS is the amount of clicking that you're gonna do. It also just feels nice. Ultimately, it was I think only 20 or $30, somewhere in that range, 30 some dollars maybe. Um, pretty good mouse. Uh, considering its price. Whereas I said that this mouse is quiet, I have a keyboard over here that is rather loud. It is the Razer Huntsman TE, I believe it's called. Um, pretty good keyboard. Um, Razer has their own kind of mechanical key makeup, which is really smooth, um, but it is of course rather loud being a mechanical keyboard. Um, down the road, I wouldn't mind getting a dynamic mic, so it would basically kind of cut out a lot of the extra audio in the room and just pick up mainly my voice. But for the time being, we're rocking the blue snowball, and that's how it's going to continue to be for the next little bit at least. The Razer Huntsman keyboard I do like, although this is more of like a gaming-specific keyboard. It doesn't have the numpad. I purposely got one without the numpad. But you know, as the saying goes, you don't really know what you have until it's gone. I realize that this is kind of true when it comes to the keyboard 
because in terms of development, like as a gaming keyboard, it's, it's I would say it's probably fine. Like, but in terms of a development keyboard, you start to miss not having the numpad, especially when you're entering in certain numbers in Unreal Engine or for whatever. You start to like wish, man, I wish I didn't have to go down the singular line of numbers like this. I wish I just had my numpad back. But hey, you know, it's just how it goes. You live and learn. Ultimately, overall, I like this keyboard. I like the chroma settings. I have a couple different presets for this keyboard for lighting. Um, but at, at the same time, right out the box, I'm pretty sure it just has an automatic uh, kind of fade on it. Um, I'm not sure if, if the if the preset lighting function is a fade, but you can set that up rather easily. Um, the Chroma software might be, I've heard that the, the software is not the best, but it works. And if you can learn how to use it well enough, hopefully it doesn't conflict with anything else. And you can get some pretty cool lighting functions going on your keyboard and, you know, create a hot key to switch the presets and stuff. I think it all in all is pretty cool. Uh, and, and if you have a camera that picks up your keyboard, it kind of just adds to the space a bit more. Um, again, it all comes back to kind of being innovative and, you know, trying to make your space stand out. And I think having a keyboard kind of like this um, can improve that. After that, we have our headphones. So I did a, quite a bit of research or quite a bit of looking around for you know, what's the best bang for your buck wireless headset, or at least I, I did enough research to the point where I thought I had a pretty informed idea. Um, and the headset that I ended up settling on was what one of the videos said was the best overall. And it was, I think the Logitech. Okay. So it is the Logitech G935 slash G933. And I'm pretty sure I own a G933. I could be wrong, but it's, it's, I think it's that model. Overall, these headphones are not too bad. Um, I think that you could definitely feel where some of the components are a little bit cheaper in terms of the buttons feel a bit kind of hollow and cheap plasticky, but I think that overall not too bad of a headset um, for the price that you're getting it for. You know, it. I think that it, it could be worse, but it, it could also be better. Ultimately down the road, I wouldn't mind getting like some SteelSeries Arctis Pro Wireless or um, something along those lines, but that is a bit more of a hefty purchase. So in the meantime, this headset's quite good. I like wireless headsets because I find that wires tend to make my neck itchy. So I think it's nice to have that wireless headset and this one um, meets the needs fairly well. I did have to sew on extra ear pads though because I found that it was often after a while the drivers would press up on my ears and I find that it was getting a bit sore. Sometimes, depending on how the placement was, you also have to kind of adjust the headband, I guess, to fit um, whatever size head you have. These are all just kind of things that you learn as you go along. I think that headphones are still one of those things that are kind of really hard to nail in the sense of choosing the best one because like, you can you can probably do a lot of research in terms of headphones in general. Once you start looking at gaming headphones, maybe you start to narrow it down a bit more, but there's still probably a lot of choices. And yeah, I would recommend definitely doing your your research and due diligence to try to find the best headset for you. Would I recommend these headphones? They're not too bad, but I definitely think you should, uh, you know, try try to see what's out there because you never know. There might be st new stuff coming out all the time. You never know. I think that pretty much wraps it up. So this was a lengthier video, but I'm hoping that it was pretty detailed and informative in terms of how my setup is orchestrated. It's something that's kind of changed a lot over the years. Um, I think it's definitely my most efficient setup, but it is still clunky in its own way. Uh, like just look at the, the, this gargantuan amount of cables, you know? It's definitely not the prettiest once you look under the hood, but it works and it works pretty well. And so hopefully in the future, maybe we'll see if I could tidy it up a bit more, but in the meantime, I'm kind of okay with it because it doesn't really get seen a whole lot. All right, guys, something that I didn't mention in the previous recording was the gaming chair that I use. So this chair is a GT Racing brand gaming chair, and it looks fairly standard as far as gaming chairs go. It comes with a headrest cushion as well as an arch support cushion. As you can see here, you can adjust the arch support cushion vertically. I didn't do the best job at demoing that. You can also um, tie the head pillow on by putting it through the holes in the chair and clipping it around the back. Not much uh, options with adjusting the head cushion. I have the heating slash cooling pad that I put on the chair myself. Got it on Amazon for probably around 30, 40 some dollars. 
the fan on the chair when you have it on the cooling option vents out heat and moisture from the chair as the user sits on it. It plugs in, uh, so you want to make sure that you have a open wall plug. Underneath the cooling pad, I have another cooling pad. This is from when I first bought the chair. Um, I just kind of have it there, I guess, for extra added cooling benefit. Don't know if it actually does anything, but nevertheless, this model of the chair, which is about 20 to $40 more than if I were to buy a similar chair without the footrest. Um, but the footrest itself overall is not the worst thing ever, but it's not that great either, mainly because of the structure of the chair. If you're not leaning back on the chair, um, or if you don't have the chair leaned back, it will feel a bit, you know, unstable. It is not the most comfortable or the most ideal leg rest, unless you lean the chair back, but it is still better than nothing. The chair also leans back, I'd say about roughly 180 degrees. The armrests are also individually adjustable, although they do not have any angle adjustments inwards or outwards. The bucket seat itself also does not have any angle adjustment options. You can adjust the height of the chair with the handle underneath the seat. You could adjust it vertically, down and up. Uh, hopefully this helped you kind of think about what ways you can maybe improve your stream setup slash YouTube slash gaming setup or maybe it'll help you to kind of think about you know what what are your goals for your setup what are some things that maybe you can do to make either things a bit easier or kind of meet whatever needs that you have for your setup um, I guess my main take key takeaways from this is just try to try to be creative with it but also try to really think about what you want to do with your setup and that will hopefully help give you a bit more direction in what things to acquire for your setup and what avenues to kind of take to get something that really works for your needs. And also, yeah, try to find those creative ways to kind of be thrifty with it and, you know, hopefully save some money because then by the time your setup's done, hopefully you'll have some money left over to actually get some games and, and do other stuff. So yeah, but definitely be wise about it um, and, you know, take your time with it. And, you know, don't spend beyond your means. You know, yeah, just, just be wise with your money as well. <laughs> All right, guys, so I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, feel free to like, comment, subscribe, and uh, check out any of my other stuff. Feel free to check out my DIY stream objects video for, or stream decorations video for kind of getting into more of the specifics of how I made the lights and the mic cover if you're interested uh, no pressure i also have a twitch channel feel free to tune in on tuesdays thursdays and saturdays i might also stream on the mondays wednesdays and fridays but no guarantees there and i will probably definitely not stream on sunday other than that i do have social media if you would like to follow me you can um, at yoden plays for both instagram and twitter yeah thanks for tuning in Hope I didn't bore you too much, and as always, remember that gameplay trailers should have gameplay, not trailers. I'm out. We'll see you in the next one, guys.